You're listening to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, Episode 79. Let's chat about BitShares, Steam, and EOS with guest Luke Stokes, current Steam witness and EOS DAC team member. Let's go. Hey, so what's up, Liberty Nation? Welcome back to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm your host, Ash Oro, and on today's show, we're going to be talking about digital entrepreneurship, of course, but then specifically about delegated proof-of-stake blockchains, Steam, EOS, and who knows, we might throw some bit shares in there. Guest today is Luke Stokes. I've been friends with Luke on Facebook and online for a couple of years, and we've kept up pretty regularly. And I was finally able to meet him in February down at the Anarchapoco Conference in Acapulco, Mexico. Luke, welcome to Liberty Entrepreneurs. Thanks so much for having me. I'm looking forward to it. So Luke, give us a quick background on who you are and how this whole crypto and freedom aspect of your life came to be. Yes. it's uh, So my story kind of starts as a programmer. I started first programming way back in 96, uh, went to school to study computer science, and eventually started building software and worked with a friend of mine, Brett Florio, built foxycart.com, which is an e-commerce shopping cart system. Worked on that for about 10 years. So I was really involved in the payment space. Uh, and as part of that, you know, I came across the, this fake internet money in 2011 and was just like, oh, what is that? That'll never do. it will never become anything. And it wasn't until I saw like the anonymous Twitter handle had like a Bitcoin address on it. Once I saw that, I was like, wait, these guys aren't stupid. That's, that's that fake internet money. Well, yeah. they, they, if they're into it, it's got to have some value. So I really dove deep at the end of 2012 and 2013. Beginning of 2013, uh, in January, I made my first purchase and it was, it was uh, 50 bucks for two and a half Bitcoin. Nice. And then I just, I just dove in from then on. I was just like, what is this internet money? This is crazy. And I started to really look at, you know, Creature from Jekyll Island, the whole kind of history of central banking, nation state governments, and everything that led me down the rabbit hole I took the, you know, took the red pill big time and started realizing that, you know, human beings should control their own store of value and Bitcoin is a big part of that. And it really kind of led to all kinds of different aspects of the philosophy of liberty and how um, this one central point of who controls the currency and this monopoly on violence that is involved in that in government really kind of got me passionate about the whole thing about voluntarism and, and everything else that goes with it. Yeah, you know, I was I was also a libertarian, and my entry point was Ron Paul, and I often wondered, like, how do we take control away from the state over our lives? And it, it seemed the more I fell down into the economic tribal hole as well, like, it was creation of money. They had a, it, None of the rest of the stuff mattered, the monopoly on force, the monopoly on schools, the monopoly on health care, the roads, or anything. None of this mattered if they didn't have a monopoly on money. Um, were you a gold and silver guy before Bitcoin or was crypto your introduction into to sound or free market money? That's a great question. And actually, I wasn't. You know, it was it was really just kind of right into Bitcoin. Uh, and then after that, I was like, well, I guess I should diversify a little bit into other forms of sound money. So then, yeah, I did buy, you know, a couple gold coins and a little bit of junk silver, you know, the, the old old coins, yeah. old silver coins. Uh and I, you know, I, I looked at that as kind of like my Katrina money, you know, something like Katrina right. ever happened in my area right. and all the power's off and I can't use my Bitcoin. You know, I can roll up with some of those uh, silver quarters and be like, hey, uh, I want a sandwich, you know, yeah. <laughs> put me to the front of the line, you know. Yeah, I and uh, that's always kind of the way I've looked at it. It's not really so much of an investment, but more so just kind of a, because the, the idea being if everything really collapses, you know you're going to want, you're going to want food, not yeah. necessarily, you know, uh, pieces of metal. So, I've, you know, I just kind of figured, eh. And as, as far as the investment, I, you know, that was also part of it, looking into the LIBOR scandal, looking into the manipulation mm. of those markets and realizing like the paper gold market and this kind of stuff, it got me realizing that I don't know that that would ever be an investment for me personally, because crypto seemed like a little bit, a cryptocurrency seemed like a harder place to do that kind of stuff. So, but I'm definitely interested in. I've, I'm watching it a lot closer than I ever have because I'm looking at the, the debt crisis and different things coming. Going like, hey, there's going to be a moment where this thing's going to be interesting. <laughs> yeah, that, that was my introduction into gold and silver. Was you know understanding the debt crisis and what happens if this sovereign bond bubble uh, collapses on us and interest rates go up, back up where they where they were, were normally or even where they were in you know the 80s and 70s. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you built Foxy Cart for 10 years. And I know that you recently just sold it. What was that like? Well, it was, 
it was interesting. It was very interesting because I, you know, I worked actually part time for four years. Part of my story is that like I was working a full time job and I'd go home, you know, I'd come home and I'd work late through the night, one, two in the morning, I'd wake up, go to work all day, come back and do the same thing. And I would work at, you know, 10 hour Saturday, I'd take Sundays off. And I did that not for a week, not for a month, not for a year, for four years mm -hmm. building my business. And a lot of people, you know, they want to be an entrepreneur. They want to have their own business. They love that idea of being their own boss. But then when the rubber hits the road and it's like, are you really willing to put in the hard work? A lot of them, they can't hack it. And they, they last a few months and then it's just like, man, this is hard. I'm not getting anywhere. So after four years of doing that, eventually I went full time with it and then did that another six years. And we built a small team. It's fully remote. So we had uh, people in Russia and Pakistan, Australia. Uh, Oklahoma. Uh, my business partner was uh, actually traveling in an RV for much of that. Uh, mm. He's now in Austin, Texas. And, and so it was, you know, it was my family, essentially, this online family of, of a team of guys that we built. And it was stable, doing well. But it got to the point where the entire cryptocurrency space was just so exploding, <laughs> so exciting. I did. Yeah. I couldn't stay away. It was just, I, I felt like I was doing the same thing I was doing before where I was doing two jobs again. You know, right. I was working on my day job yeah. and then I'd go and stay up too late at night doing cryptocurrency stuff, researching projects, looking into master coins, looking at ICOs, blogging on Steam it and providing value there. You know, it just, it, it got to the point where it was just too much. And I, I said, you know what? You know, we already, we already paid off the house with cryptocurrency. That mm -hmm. was a big deal. as part of my story growing up when I was in high school, we lost our house. Mm. So, it was a big deal for me. And once I got to that point, I said, you know what? I'm in a place where I can take a risk. Now I've got three young kids, I've got a wife, definitely. Uh, she's amazing and awesome to go on this crazy journey with me. <laughs> but uh, it got to the point where I was just like, you know what? If I really believe what I believe, and it's the same thing I believed back in 2013 about the future value of cryptocurrency. When I saw it go up to 1200 and crash down to 250, I didn't sell because I was still looking to a future value, a future value. So I just said, you know, if I'm right, then this is going to be the best move I could make. It's just fully focus in this, this space. And if I'm wrong, ah, eh, you know, I can yeah. always get a job. Yeah, <laughs> right. I, I, yeah, yeah, exactly. I can always build something. Like once you have, yeah, I don't think I'll ever get a job again. I just, yeah, no <laughs> way. It's like, I can't imagine. I spent seven years in doing that cube life. And, and now that I've been on the road for six and a half, like being an entrepreneur, I couldn't imagine driving in 40 minutes to work every morning. But Oh man, I know. I'm the yeah, same. I, I, I hear you though. When you see something that really like gets you passionate, then dive in, you know, and, that, and I'm speaking to the audience right now. It's like, if you want to become an entrepreneur, like you got to find that thing where you don't mind putting in 10 hours on a Saturday. I mean, I've done it building the uh, Liberty virtual assistance and even building your Pacific bank. I mean, I freaking loved it and I couldn't get enough of it. And you just find out all these, like you'll build this little system and then you'll spin it off and it'll work for you. And then you'll be like, Oh, but I could build this on top of this and I can automate this. And then that makes it more efficient. It's just like, you know, I, I call it the build bug. Once you get that build bug, you can't stop building. Um, moving from Foxy car into crypto was, I, I think you're going to look back and it's going to be one of those, one of those life changing events. I, I know speaking with you in February down in Mexico, you literally just sold it while we were there. And you were like, yeah. you know, Ash, I, I built this business for 10 years and now I sold it and I'm collecting imaginary internet tokens. Like w what was that like? Oh man. Yeah. I, I tweeted about this a little while ago. I'm like I, I sold my stable business. I spent 10 years building. And now I'm basically doing project work for, you know, magic tokens that people create out of nothing, you know? <laughs> and the fun part is like, I've been doing a lot of education in the whole, like, what is money category? Like just trying to help people understand the, the nature of financial value itself and how it is very subjective. And it is this kind of shared belief system. And so it was kind of neat that some of the people reply to that and kind of go, yeah, kind of like all money, you know, kind of like the pieces <laughs> of paper we have with dead right, people on point. them. Like, yeah. You know, and, and it's interesting that the support I've gotten from people has been very encouraging because they, they know my story. You know, they know, you know, I've actually just on Steam and I've, I've been doing a series on the, all the tweets I did in 2013 about Bitcoin. I've been doing that mm -hmm. lately. People know that story and they followed that story. In the beginning, it was kind of like, what is Luke doing with this fake internet money? And now it's kind of like, oh, Luke paid off his house with that yeah. fake internet money. It's like, <laughs> yeah. maybe we should listen, you know? Right. So I've had a number of people really uh, support it. It was, it was definitely, and still is, I mean, it's been pretty incredible, but at the same time, so it, it's definitely, you know, uh, I'm, I'm concerned. Like I have to basically live off my crypto now, you know, I have to do these kind of things. That means I have to sell to like, you know, pay bills and things. Mm. But at the same time, I, 
I'm really passionately excited about what I get to do every single day. I mean, I woke up, I mean, this basically starting this year, because what I, I, my business partner and I worked out, it was like, well, you're still around, but let's pretend as if you already sold and let's kind of see if the team can work without you. And that's what we did. And it worked out really well. So this whole, you know, three months or so that it's been into this year, it's been like the greatest time of my entire life. Like just every day waking up going, what can I do today to provide the most value? Yeah. And I've just, I, that level of freedom and autonomy, I just, I can't even describe. It's so amazing. It's so yeah. incredible. And so my, my goal right now is just to keep that going as long as I can, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I hear you, man. And I think for me, I, I want to give a little bit of appreciation to you. You really, you were the one that got me truly interested in down uh, the rabbit hole of delegated proof of stake. And I know how nerdy that sounds, but once I started researching bit shares and steam you know i'd been on steam since june or july of 2016 inactively uh, interviewed ned back in august of 2016 but i really didn't pay attention to the differences in the consensus mechanisms and just how these blockchains were built and i was kind of getting tired of proof of work and i didn't really understand proof of stake but once you started talking about you know what dan had created and delegated proof of stake wow what what a what a technology that is when did you start understanding or really appreciating uh, delegated proof of stake as a concept and as a blockchain? And most importantly, how it supports a community. And before you answer that, thank you, Luke, for introducing me to this because I love the type of functional and technical ability and social ability that these types of chains are able to support. So thank you. You are very welcome. I mean, you definitely dove in with both feet. I mean, you were messaging me on Facebook. What, what's up with this? What's up with that? And you were just like passionately excited about it. That was very encouraging. I'm like, oh, yeah, another entrepreneur kind of sees what I see. That's yeah. awesome. You know, uh, yeah, it, it was, you know, I first joined in, in 2016 in June. I had two different friends, actually, Sean King and Bill Butler. And Bill Butler's been involved in BitShares for a long time. Sean King, I worked with, we, we created a nonprofit back in the day uh, in, around the Bitcoin space. And he was like, man, steam, steam it, check it out. You've got to get on board. And I remember, I think it was like camping at the time and I created an account. Yeah, there we go. You know, uh, I created the account and I, I got back after, I think it was in July that I posted my first post. And then my second post, I did, uh, I did a post on nonviolent communication and I got like a $30 upvote from Dan. And I was yeah. kind of like, what is this? You know? right. and, then, and then of course I started reading Dan's stuff and figuring out he was the, the guy who created this whole thing. And I'd already gone through the drama of the block debate, the block size debate for Bitcoin. Right. Like I can remember in 2014, 2015, they're saying, hey, this is going to break in 2017. Like we got to fix this. 2016 rolls around, 2017 yeah. rolls around. You know, it's just like, and everything that they were talking about, the things I was really frustrated about in the proof of work space came true. And, and there was no mechanism. And, and again, I, I try to think about everything in terms of motivational and, and basic economics and the idea that the miners had an incentive to keep the blocks full and have high fees. The users had an incentive to have a system that functions and works really well. And they couldn't agree on a good solution to solve that. And I, and I appreciate where it's going with Lightning Network and SegWit and all that. I understand you know, both sides of that debate and argument, but it really, to me, demonstrated we needed something on chain for governance. And when I learned about delegated proof of stake, this idea that one, we're not being extremely wasteful. It's, it's not competition, it's cooperation. Right. And with that cooperation, instead of maybe 10 minute block times, you get three second block times. Mm -hmm. Instead of ridiculous fees when the network is clogged, you get zero fees. Right. Instead of uh, you know this gridlock between what the users want and what the block producers want, we have a situation where the actual stakeholders, those who have the most invested in the system can say, hey, let's, let's elect some people who actually are gonna have our interest in mind. And so the, the, the beauty of delegated proof of stake is that the, the people that are actually securing the network, they're getting paid well to do so, they are acting in the best interests of the users. And that creates a situation where the community actually has a say and an investment stake in the entire platform. And they're not going to get in this gridlock situation. So I learned about from uh, Bill learned about BitShares as well, which is also delegated proof of stake. And then from that and using Steam it now for you know almost two years, getting really excited about the coming of EOS and learning about that. And it just it, the more and more I learned about Dan Larimer, the more and more I learned about the stuff he's built, I mean, I think he's the most prolific blockchain developer on the planet. I mean, 
He built ProtoShares. He built BitShares 1.0. Then he rebuilt it to BitShares 2.0 when graphing right. came out. Now he's, then he built Steam and now he's building EOS. And I just love his vision for securing life, liberty, and property. It's just, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, and it's amazing. You know, it doesn't surprise me, but it's amazing that uh, anarcho-capitalist, you know, someone who does appreciate and live by the non-aggression principle, but also understands the role that capitalism plays in um, securing life, liberty, and property, and, and how the free market is intertwined into freedom. You know, that, that's one of the main reasons that I support uh, what Dan builds and, you know, big supporter of EOS, BitShares, and, and Steam is because I, I feel like our, we're aligned. He, the morals are aligned. And that's the type of community that I choose to be a part of. Not, not like in the geographic nation state world where, yeah, you can move from place to place and try to get your community. But here we have a much more freedom and a much more opportunity to choose our communities. Um, you know, you were on Steam for about two years now, and you were a blogger for quite some time, and uh, becoming a very a quite successful blogger. I think you have over ten thousand, or maybe fifteen thousand followers on Steam now. Uh, something like yeah, it's more than ten thousand. It's amazing. It's, yeah. uh, it's been great. Yeah, and and then you became a witness. What is a witness? How did you go that transition? transition from just a user to a witness and remind us what the difference is between proof of stake and delegated proof of stake. Oh, great stuff. Great stuff. Uh, <laughs> well, to back up a little bit, a witness is essentially a block producer. So like a miner is a block producer in proof of work. A witness is an elected block producer. And so what essentially that means, it's someone who runs a little bit of software and actually, you know, you got a backup node and a main node and you run a seed node and maybe a full node. And you're, you're literally running software that validates transactions and signs them with your signing key. And in order to be a witness, you have to kind of configure your account, configure your setup, and then you have to get votes from the community. The community has to, <clears throat> excuse me, has to elect you in this position. And this is a position that's paid by the blockchain. So just like in Bitcoin, whenever there's a new uh, block produced and there's a reward for that, the witnesses also get paid in Steam, in actually Steam Power, for their block production. So when I first joined, I was hearing a lot about witnesses and I was like, oh, that's really cool. But as more of a programmer, I was not a huge fan of like DevOps and managing servers and all that kind of stuff, and Docker right. containers. I mean, I was just like, yeah, I know how to do that, but it's not my passion. Right. And I kind of just didn't think much about it. And then over and over again, people kept saying, why aren't you a witness? You should be a witness. We need someone like you involved. Because I realized as it went on, it's not just running a node. It's also you get to be involved in the economic discussions. Mm -hmm. You get to actually do code review on the hard forks that come out that Steam Incorporated develops. And the more and more I started learning about the position, the more I realized, oh, this is a really important position to, to actually protect those concepts that you and I have been talking about this whole time. Mm -hmm. And so I finally realized, you know what, I, I'm gonna go ahead and put my, put my hat out there and, and put my, you know, go, it's, it's almost like a blockchain politician. You know, you go out there and try to, try to get votes. And it was interesting because I, I think I only told two of my friends who, who are already supporting me on Steam saying, hey, just so you know, I'm a witness now. And they were like, oh, awesome. And they voted for me. And after that, I just put it in my signature on my posts and kind of went from there. And I've been amazed at the support I've gotten. I, I quickly rose up through the ranks. And then I think it was, uh, I think it was the end of last year. I forget exactly when I got bumped into the top 20. And the top 20 block producers are the producers that actually get to define the consensus. Right. The 21st producer gets rotated in from, the, from all the 100 uh, beneath that. And so it's, it's a beautiful setup because it, the difference between proof of stake and delegated proof of stake is with a proof of stake blockchain, it essentially can become an oligarchy, which is like whoever's got all the money continues to get more money. <laughs> and, right. and there's the, the people that are coming in, they kind of have very little say in how to change who gets to define the parameters of the, of the blockchain. But with delegated proof of stake, even if you only have a little bit of uh, stake in the system, if you have enough people and you all come together, mm -hmm. you can actually make change and you can remove a block producer and put in a different block producer. If somebody's being a bad actor, if their their price feed is not uh, up to date and accurate, that's something that a, a witness does as well, mm -hmm. is they provide a price feed that the blockchain looks at to say, what's the current price of Steam? So that it knows how much Steam blockchain dollars to produce, what the uh, the payout should be on a post. So it's it's a really amazing system 
that I think more and more people are starting to finally understand. It's taking a little while. Like I've been talking at conferences about this, talking to people about it, and they're always kind of like, oh, delegate proof of stake, that's centralized. I'm saying, well, actually, how many mining uh, pools are there for uh, Bitcoin? And they're like, oh, yeah, I guess there's only like three or four. Like, yeah, we have at least 20 independent block producers. And by the way, they can be removed in a moment's notice by the community. And you can't really do that with a mining farm. You know? and, and you can vote in to have more um, witnesses. That, you know, Right now, I think it's 21 in Steam. I think it's going to be 21 in EOS. But if the community thinks that 21 isn't decentralized enough, we'll vote in 121. And now all of a sudden you've just grown five or six times the number of block producers or, or proof of work people, the number of miners in your system. I mean, I know a lot of people have criticized the way that they think it's politicized delegated proof of stake mm -hmm. and how there could be vote buying and how there could be um, different different types of ways to try to throw the vote and continually get block producers elected and where they're not held accountable to the voting populace. But I, I can't find a way that it's at the worst as bad as uh, proof of work or standard proof of stake. And at the best, it's a way better governance mechanism. You know, why do you think it's taking people so long to figure out that we can't automate everything? Value is subjective and that governance is going to have a subjective level to it do you think that there do you think that people old school crypto people get caught up in the idea that humans are fallible so we just need to remove them altogether yeah i think there's a bit of that you know when you look at like the debates between larimer and vitalik there's a bit of that you know some people are saying we just automate all the things and we talk about and that's interesting we talk about distributed autonomous corporations or distributed autonomous organizations or distributed autonomous or you know uh, communities that's a big part of it what does autonomous actually mean there well i don't think it means ai at this point at some right. point maybe but at this point it's it's human beings are still actually involved in the process of making decisions and working with governance. But the important point is that the entire thing lives on regardless of who the, who the human beings are. Mm -hmm. And the, the protocols themselves are running out on the internet, out on the blockchain. They can't be censored, they can't be stopped, they can't be centralized in terms of like a government trying to take over. And so I think there's just this, this kind of, you know, it's interesting. There's a whole backstory as far as Dan Larimer himself, and there's a lot of people that don't get him. A lot of people that don't like the way uh, the, the 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 great consolidation happened within the BitShares history, and there's people that, that he's just a genius, honestly. And I think he's he's on another level than a lot of people. And so when he explains stuff, they're like, "What? I don't get it. Well, whatever. It doesn't make sense." And so they're just kind of want to stick with what they know. And I feel like a lot of genius people are usually a few years ahead of everybody else. And I feel like that's what Dan Larimer has been doing. He's been building tools that it's just taking a while for people to understand the power of the tools. And so what I love about Steam right now as an example, it's processing more transactions than every other blockchain on the planet combined. combined. It's amazing. Right now. Yeah. And it's just, so it's kind of, it's getting to the point where people can't like just wavy hand it away. They're just right. like, oh wait, this, this is for real. Uh, I need to know how this works, you know? And so finally people are starting to realize like this is a pretty amazing blockchain it has some pretty amazing characteristics. I mean, even account recovery was one of the most amazing things I'd ever seen in any public private key system. Yeah. Usually you lose your private key, you are done. And there right. is nothing you can do about it. All that money is gone, everything yeah. is gone. He, and he developed this ingenious system where within 30 days you can actually challenge an account. And if you can prove that you have one of the private keys from any of the, the memo key, the posting key, the active key, the owner key, any one of those, you can recover your account. Uh, and, and that's with a shared account recovery person that you actually get to set. So essentially someone would have to steal your keys and like jack your buddy at the same time. <laughs> and it's right. just like, he invents these things that are just so amazing right. that it's just so far beyond what people are thinking. So, and there's a little bit of the Bitcoin maximalist as well. You know, people mm -hmm. are just, you know, proof of work is the only way because that's what Bitcoin uses and every other coin is a shit coin. You know, like right. you hear this all the time. So, uh, you know, to me, I think it's just a matter of, you know, we're just going to prove it. And I think EOS is going to be yep. a really big surprise with all the number of enterprises that come on to EOS, all the different corporations that realize they have to be a distributed autonomous system. And, and we were talking earlier about this, but I'm really excited. Recently just joined the launch team for EOS DAC, which is a candidate for an EOS block producer. And the idea being that, you know, there's going to be these block producers on EOS, but even those can be decentralized. We, even those can be community driven and community run. And it's just, it's an exciting space. It's amazing.
Yeah, by the time this episode is released, I'll have released uh, my interview with uh, David Packham of EOS 42 and their Shintai uh, delegation market, similar to like Minnow Booster on Steam, where mm -hmm. you can lend and lease tokens to access the, the EOS network resources. Um, I'm not nearly as familiar with EOS DAC. Uh, can you give us a definition of what a DAC is and how is it different than one of these more centralized block producer candidates? And just for the record, a block producer is very similar to a witness in Steam. If there's mm -hmm. any main differences, uh, Luke, feel free to let us know. Yeah, I, I think one of the differences is that this is going to be a much, much bigger deal. Like <laughs> most of the Steam witnesses are just a, you know, a, a person with a server and they're making that happen. Right. Uh, this is going to be whole teams of people. We're talking, you know, million dollar infrastructure type situation mm -hmm. because of the scale of this blockchain. This is a global blockchain and it's actually coordinated geographically because they're they're actually concerned about latency of the speed of light as things are moving around the planet. Insane. You know, yeah. these are things we're thinking about as far as latency between nodes. And so there it's it's gonna be uh, much more advanced, I think, than than the Steam blockchain. But at the same time, um, and it's also going to be generic. Like the Steam blockchain is beautifully designed specifically for media companies and people mm -hmm. that want to produce media content. So that's why I have DLive and DTube and huge fan of everything that Steam is doing to make it easier for developers in that space. EOS is more generic. Though, and so it's going to be able to create any kind of uh, organization or software that you want to build on a blockchain. I kind of describe it as the AWS of blockchain technology, the Amazon Web Services. Every business, just like they knew they had to get on the internet, they're going to know they have to get on the blockchain, and right. they're going to turn to, to EOS because it is the most. It's going to be the most uh, like active blockchain as far as its ability to. It's going to be like half second block times and, and incredible business friendly. What's that? And, and business friendly blockchain. I mean, oh, this yes. Is, I, yes. I, you know, I posted the other day that you know liberty minded people use Bitcoin. You know, but business savvy, liberty minded people are going to use EOS. It's just yeah. the difference between can you build a business on your blockchain? And we've already that, seen. That's exactly, I think, what we're excited about with EOS DAC. EOS DAC, a DAC is a distributed autonomous, either corporation or community or company or a distributed autonomous organization. Right. And the idea behind that, what that essentially means is it's community led, community driven. So you have a similar system where you have a group of people that are going to be elected by the community, the token holders, and those people are going to be responsible for making decisions, just like a normal company in that sense, you know, running it and things like that. But the difference with this and like a normal like board of directors or an actual company is this is really owned and operated by the community. They get to decide and they are the ones that are going to make things happen. So what we're going to be focusing on with the EOS DAC is actually building tools to help DACs. So we're a DAC that's going to build tools to run our own DAC. And then right. as we learn how that works, and every entrepreneur understands this in programming, they call it eating your own dog food. You know, sure. you, 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 you actually work and use the tools that you build, the, the, the tools you're working on, you actually use them yourself. And then you immediately go, oh, hey, that's what we need. So like even today, we had a conversation about uh, how our tools need to be multilingual because we're already dealing with that right now. We have right. so many communities in EOS DAC that speak different languages that immediately we're like, yeah, we have to build tools for managing multilingual communities. Well, there we go. Like immediately we're starting to see exactly the type of tools that we'll have to build to help support other DACs. They're going to be built on EOS. So that's, that's kind of the mission of EOS DAC is we're going to be a block producing DAC that is owned by the community and we're going to be building these tools for other DACs. And as yeah. far as like why that's important as opposed to like a centralized block producer, you know, there's a lot of different perspectives on that. Uh, I, I, you know, the debates are ongoing as far as who the best block producer should be. Uh, ultimately, I think it's whoever's going to provide the most value to the network and the community. And that includes first and foremost, having incredible infrastructure for securely producing blocks on a blockchain. And I, I'm really excited that I have a lot of experience with that on the Steam blockchain and I can bring that to EOS stack. But then beyond that, there's going to be a, a lot of funds as part of this block reward and thinking about how those funds are going to be used, what projects are they going to be involved in, and who's going to get to determine what those projects are. I've, I even heard one uh, candidate, I don't know if they've announced yet, they've even talked about burning the extra because they didn't want the political you know, oh, right. connections with being involved in a certain project or another. But I look at it more towards an opportunity for leadership, you know, like you mentioned uh, with, with Shintai and, and these, these great tools that the community is going to need. Different block producers could say, hey, we're going to work with them. We're going to support them. We're going to be involved in that. 
And we look at it as saying these decisions need to be made by someone. We want them to be made by the token holders. We want to be an example of what's possible with DAX. And, and by doing that, hopefully we're going to learn all the tough lessons ourselves as we figure out how to do the membership, how we do voting, how we do all that kind of stuff. So that everyone can look at us and say, oh, hey, there's a DAC that's actually doing it. Right. It's actually functioning with a large community of people. And then from that, we're allocating funds to make sure things are getting done correctly. And the community can see that everything transparent, everything on the blockchain. Uh, it, it's going to be it's going to be beautiful. I'm really, really excited about it. Yeah, and it sounds very entrepreneurial. I mean, you're building tools to support yourself so that you can build a tool to offer to the community. But if you're if you're figuring out these problems, you're going to offer your tools out to the community to use to build their DAX as well. I mean, yep. this is this is kind of how it happens. You know, every entrepreneur stands on the shoulder of previous entrepreneurs, and it just sounds so beautiful to me that you guys are figuring out problems because you want to build something to offer to the community. And while you figure out those problems, everyone doesn't have to reinvent the wheel. You know, yes. I, I really appreciate yeah. that. Um, let's talk about the EOS DAC token because I think that they have a, quite a unique, well, at least it's unique for now, distribution model. Yes, we, we're doing, as, the, as of when this airs, the airdrop will probably already be done, but we are doing an airdrop on all EOS token holders. And what's important to think about this token is it's really kind of an invitation to membership of the club that we're building, essentially. It's not, it's not like you don't get any ownership in the company. You don't get any, there's no guarantee of any benefits or anything like that. It's literally, we're not selling it. There's no ICO. It's just a free token that's an invitation to membership. And once we convert over to the actual EOS uh, mainnet, we're gonna convert those ERC20 tokens over to EOS stack tokens on EOS. And then people will get to opt in. They get to decide like, yeah, I wanna take my token and I wanna apply for membership essentially. And that would just involve, uh, we won't you know, be gathering personal information, things like that. We would just be gathering, you know, here's the constitution that we have with EOS stack. And of course the EOS constitution as well and making sure people opt into that. And they say, yeah, this is this is something I believe in. This is These are the, the guidelines that I'm going to be a part of if I'm part of this community. And then from there, they, they are going to be granted voting rights at that point. Um, and so it's, it's interesting. I think we're going to see a lot of token distributions like that, because as you know, with currency, one of the most important things that gives currency value is the network effect. Sure. And if you don't have a wide distribution, this is another one of the criticisms with the Steam blockchain, is that the early miners and even Steam it itself, they, they hold a lot of tokens. You know, they launched on April 1st, and a lot of people were like, is this even for real? And you know, there, so I love the year-long ICO. A lot of people have given Block One some flack about that, but me personally, I think it's one going to be one of the most widely distributed cryptocurrencies. I mean, we're already pretty fairly distributed, and it's not even launched yet, and that's an amazing thing to me. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that we're going to be able to tap into that value and say, hey, we're going to basically connect with the most widely distributed token so that our membership potential is widely distributed. And these are people that are already passionate about what EOS represents. And that's important as well. Yeah. We're seeing that in other uh, projects that are building on EOS, specifically the uh, Everpedia team mm -hmm. are airdropping all of their tokens. There's no ICO. Of course, they're, they're not saying there's any value or anything to these tokens, but they're airdropping the, I think they're called IQ tokens to what's essentially going to be a decentralized Wikipedia that mm -hmm. people can edit. And I, I don't know exactly how the coin works, uh, the utility of the coin, but it's going to be used to reward people for keeping this decentralized Wikipedia or Everpedia accurate and up to date, which, you know, think about if the steam model of being able to pay out was integrated with Wikipedia and then you've got Wik and then you've got Everpedia. It's it's really amazing. Speaking about token utility, can you run us through like an, a use case or an example use case of how an EOS DAC token holder would be able to utilize their tokens as a member of the community? You know, I the 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 fun thing about that is I can't. I, I've I've joined the membership launch team, but after that, I have no say. Like I have mm. to be elected to actually be a custodian on that chain. And they're gonna, basically the community is gonna make all those decisions. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna set up some basic tools and I've already looked at you know, the, the outlines for these tools and, and where everything we do is gonna be open source. But the basic tools are gonna just be, you know, you can become a member and you can, you know, uh, basically vote in a, a custodian. And that's essentially it. How the tokens are going to be used beyond that is really up to the community. And this is what's so amazing about this is it's really going to be a community-run, community-owned 
club essentially. And, um, it's exciting. We, we, you know, there's been a number of, uh, proposals, uh, you know, including, um, you know, that block producer reward maybe being distributed in interesting ways. Uh, to, you know, there have been uh, talking of supporting existing projects or even investing in, you know, helping DAX get on board and maybe even having training tools where they're open source, but then there's even a for pay model and, you know, having another revenue model for EOStack. And so there's, there's a lot of really exciting potential here. And, and at this point, it, I'm happy to say I don't know because it's going to be uh, determined by the members. And, we, and as of yet, we don't know who those members are until EOS launches, until they get their token and people sign up. So it's going to be exciting wild ride, and I'm really looking forward to it. Yes, the great thing about the free market is we can say, I don't know, who's going to build the roads? Well, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know who's going to build the blockchain roads or the blockchain voting roads. Or I, I'm not sure, but I, I trust that if there's a need or if there's a desire, then it's going to be built. Um, I'd like to wrap up here, Luke, with a concept that I find really, really fascinating. Uh, I, I call it voluntary inflation. And I know Dan's written about this. And I was recently in Sydney, Australia at the Keys to Freedom Conference and presented mm -hmm. on how voluntary inflation can build digital communities. And I highlighted, of course, one of my favorite blockchains, Steam, right? And I know that this is going to exist as well in EOS, but what does voluntary inflation mean to you and, and where do you see voluntary inflation being used specifically on steam or potentially on eos to fund and build a community i i think the key word is voluntary everything that i want to do in my life i want it to be voluntary i want to have i, mean, I look at blockchains as a mechanism for globally decentralized nonviolent consensus and i just that to me is amazing and so the idea the problems we see in the world and anyone who kind of does a little bit of a deep dive in this, like we were talking about earlier, looking at central banking and nation state governments and how they've used that monopoly on currency creation to take inflation to ridiculous levels. I think it's automatically created a feeling in people that they reject all forms of inflation right. and, and everything like that is bad. And I, I'm back to what you said about voluntary. To me, it, if if a system is inflationary or deflationary, it it doesn't matter as much as if it's con consensual unless it's voluntary. And to me, this idea that we can create rewards and distribute them according to a known protocol that is agreed to by the community, Bitcoin has already demonstrated that that works very well. And so it's that same kind of model is that we're, yes, we are issuing new currency, but it's not like behind the scenes in some, you know, central bankers, you know, vault right. meeting that we don't give access to and have no say over that the inflation rate just, oh, today is something different. You know, right. this is all going to be determined by consensus. And that's going to be, that's going to be the big difference for me. So when we create inflation, we create new token distribution. Uh, we may not get it right. And that's what I love about this system as well. Like in the Steam blockchain, when it first started, I can remember um, there was a point in time where I think Ned was making like $700,000 a week or something ridiculous. Like it was like right, yeah. it was when the token spiked up to like four bucks and I was like, um, guys, I, just, I think this is messed up. Like yeah. this is not sustainable. And, and they did, we did, we changed it. You know, I wasn't a, a witness at that time, but they did a hard fork and they changed the amount of inflation in the system. So I look at that as an example that I can just point to and say, hey, we get to decide. We get to voluntarily decide, you know, how much inflation do we need? And, and we're not always going to get it right. But we've seen this in BitShares. We've seen this in Steam. And now we're going to see it again in EOS. And this is a beautiful thing. We're actually experimenting with competing currencies. And it's just, it's awesome. And so I think, like, if the inflation is too much, we'll fix it. If it's too little and, and we're actually not giving the block producers enough currency to support the actual chain, well, clearly we'll change that as well. Yeah. So to me, it's, it's an exciting example of kind of the new form of tokenomics and economics that are based on actual reality of individual people voluntarily working out what, what works and what doesn't. Because we've so, for so long, we've had this like violence back you know, centralized monopoly system yeah. that just so distorts price discovery, so destroys any kind of market signals that we've not been able to experiment yet. And now we get to, and I'm really passionate about that. Yeah, I, I'm so passionate and curious about what the free market is going to be able to bloom into now that we have serious currency competition backed by, you know, voluntary action. If you don't like the the inflation rate of Bitcoin, sell your Bitcoin and buy Dogecoin or sell your Dogecoin and buy Steam. You know, you don't even have to vote with your feet anymore. You vote with your wallet. 
your token wallet and it's easier than ever to exchange in and out of these tokens and it's just we're it's, building yes no rulers baby it's no no, rulers. no you know th this was the last <laughs> note i had here ask ask him to show his shirt <laughs> <laughs> i love this shirt it's one of my favorite shirts yeah uh, it's just no rulers is going to create an amazing opportunity for humanity and increase well-being in such a phenomenal ways. Yeah, I love it. It, it, it increases wealth around the world. You know, I, I there's a I'll, I'll leave with this. There's um, an author, a user on Steemit called at Ben Dollars, and I I don't know who this guy is. This is obviously not his last name, and I saw him post the other day, actually, the other month at this point. And where him and his family got really excited because he got his first steam payout. He's from Nigeria. And like, this is a big deal. And I come from the offshore banking space. And I was like, man, I, we would never be able to send this guy a wire, you know, mm -hmm. money. And if we were, it would be so expensive and so highly scrutinized that most likely it would have never gotten there. And they were celebrating because he made like five or 10 bucks. You know, I went through and I just upvoted every post and comment of his that I could because this was so amazing. We can support people anywhere in the world without needing AML or KYC, without needing to know who they are, and maybe without even talking to them in far off lands that we may never visit. It's, you know, this whole concept of voluntary inflation, I'm, I'm indebted to, to Dan Larimer for sure for helping me change my perspective on what inflation is and that it's not the enemy. It's only the enemy whenever it's force-based. Um, Luke, you are absolutely a liberty entrepreneur and a freedom fighter. I, I appreciate you. You've got a really good handle on economics and on tokenomics and these blockchains. And I, I, I thank you for what you've done in this whole blockchain space. I wish you and the EOS DAC team tremendous good luck. You guys absolutely have my vote. I can't wait to see what type of tools you create so entrepreneurs like me can build a better and freer future on EOS and on Steam and any other blockchain we voluntarily choose to build on. So would you like to leave us with any remarks or contact information on how people can get in touch with you or the EOS DAC team? I just, I want to say, first of all, thank you, Ash, for the opportunity. I know we talked about for so long getting together <laughs> to do this. I'm glad we finally got to. Uh, yeah, I'm just Luke Stokes. That's L-U-K-E-S-T-O-K-E-S -E -E on Steemit. Also Luke Stokes on Twitter. Those are probably the two best ways to kind of connect with me and say hello. I'd love to, you just give me a shout out. I'd love to say hi. And it really is just an amazing time to be alive. You know, we get to be part of this incredible revolution that's nonviolent and it's just uh, incredible and so thank you for the part you're playing to uh, educate entrepreneurs on the future and what's coming it's really exciting you're welcome Luke. i'll leave all of your contact info in the show notes as well as the eos stack twitter and website and some information there Luke. thank you so much for coming on liberty entrepreneurs thank you for having me